Welcome to another episode of Nintendo Fuse's Industry Talk. I am your host, Barry, and I am joined by my colleague, Mike, today. Hello. And our special guest of the evening, Evan Godwin. Hello, hello. Now, Evan, you have a Kickstarter up right now for the BitLounger large and extra large storage systems. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So the uh, BitLounger large and, and basically the XL system, what they are, are modular, customizable storage and display solutions for retro video game collectors. Um, one of the things that we kind of noticed, um, you know, back when we were doing a little bit of research on, you know, trying to find solutions for our own collections was that there was a lot of stuff that you could do, but none of them were really designed for retro video games specifically. Um, and any of the options that kind of existed for retro video games were uh, not particularly high quality, you know. So, uh, you know, we put together this Kickstarter to kind of solve that problem. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, I see you had another one beforehand. What was that like? So that was, that was a lot of fun. That was actually kind of how we tested the waters. Um, the, the L and XL system have kind of been in the works for about three or four years now at this point. And so last year, instead of kind of going all in with that and that being our first experience and trying to rock and roll, you know, with, I guess, what we consider our big project, you know, we started with something a little bit smaller with, uh, with a tray that just held uh, 10 Super Nintendo cartridges. Didn't really have a dust cover, but the tray itself was specifically created to fit the uh, Super Nintendo cartridges. Um, you know, we got that funded in five days. We had, uh, we actually launched the project, got it funded and shipped in 77 days flat. So we were really kind of excited about that after hearing so much bad publicity about people who have had terrible experiences backing Kickstarter campaigns. Yeah, Kickstarter is always hit and miss. <clears throat> now, I, I didn't miss your first uh, Kickstarter, uh, but that actually sounds interesting uh as a collector myself super nintendo is a big problem and the reason for that is the space obviously is a big issue and when stacking super nintendo games up if you have any with those dust protectors it yeah. goes very lopsided very quickly, <laughs> very and, quickly. And, and it becomes a nightmare so can can we take you know your first thing that you your, your product that you already have and can we put it actually like vertical like in a bookcase and actually stick them in that way well, and it's funny you mentioned that because uh, this was probably about three or four months ago or so. You know, we, we've been working on the, the newest Kickstarter that's live right now for a handful of months. But while, while we were uh, working on that, we, we got a uh, Twitter question from somebody who was like, hey, can, can we tilt these trays upright and, and do them vertically? And so I, I dug one out and found some cartridges and stuck it on this conference table. And it... It's, it wasn't designed to do that, but it does hold the cartridges and they don't slip out, uh, you know, assuming that the tray is flush with the, with the ground. See, because that, that would be a huge help uh, for okay. me personally uh, right. to be able to do that uh, because, like I said, Super Nintendo and 64 are great. NES are great, right. but, but right. Super Nintendo just are not designed to be stacked on top of each other. So, no. so, so that would definitely uh, be interesting. Now, now this... This system, one thing I like is that you can have four or two to four, depending on large or extra large, uh, different trays. Uh, they could all be the same system or they can be customizable, which I think is great as a showpiece, especially yeah. if you have some holy grails or just some personal favorites from multitude different systems. Yeah. Uh, what made you come up with that idea to mix and match and not make a, this is a Super Nintendo only, this is a Nintendo only, you know, et cetera? Right, and that's, that's a fantastic question. And how we kind of finalized this one was uh, the response that we got after we did uh, our first Kickstarter last year. You know, um, that one was, was pretty successful. We were pretty happy with it. Uh, and then next thing we know is that pretty regularly we were getting emails and tweets and Instagram messages from people saying, hey, when are you going to do one for N64? Hey, when are you going to do one for Game Boy? When are you going to do one for Sega Genesis? When are you going to do one for NES? So on and so forth. And uh, the response initially was, oh, yeah, 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 like that's in the works, right? Like that's what people, that's what everybody says that, hey, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's coming at some point. Um, and so we, I then kind of realized, you know, 
finalizing this modular, uh, I guess, concept, it would just be great if there was a base system that you could purchase. And then, you know, like you said, you can switch out the trays. You can have all one type of tray. And basically what it boiled down to is bringing to market a dedicated uh, standalone tray like we did for the Super Nintendo for every single system that people want was just extraordinarily cost prohibitive in such a niche market. And, uh, you know, the cost of creating these insert trays is about one third of the cost of doing the standalone tray. So it just kind of boiled down to, hey, you know, if we can if we can uh, effectively and efficiently have these insert trays manufactured, uh, then the only real thing that we have to worry about cost wise are these the base trays for the L or the XL system. Um, but since it fits so many different games, you know, a much larger market of collectors are kind of a you know, uh, our target market, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah, one thing, I'm, I'm kind of curious where you got the idea for the uh, design, because when I look at the design, I don't know how far back you go when you're collecting yeah. or even, even your experience, but I see the old Atari 2600 game centers that they would sell with the plastic top, <laughs> and you would have the system lined in there with the games underneath. Like, that's what it looks like to me. Like, oh, my God, this yeah. is a throwback. Is that... <laughs> remotely close to what you were going with or am I, I wish it, I wish it were I don't go back that far <laughs> um, don't my it, age here. it's okay <laughs> uh, what it basically was was initially our kind of like our first our first prototype uh, for this were essentially I had some uh, like foam inserts custom foam inserts created that were uh, like laser like had notches laser cut. Um, and so it was essentially just kind of this flat piece of foam that would sit in a shelf and, you know, it had all these specific things cut out so that way you could slot the games in there. And then one of the questions that kind of kept coming up with our last Kickstarter was, oh, does this have a dust cover or can we get a dust cover? And since that one didn't particularly have one, I was like, well, this is kind of like something people want. Uh, and the design was actually more inspired by a, uh, a record player. Um, it's my second guess. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was sitting there at home in my chair, working on doing some preliminary design work for this, and I was like, man, you know, I was thinking about doing like a removable dust cover that was more of like a lid, and I was coming up with all these things. And next thing I know, I was just kind of like staring off in the space, and my record player was sitting there, and I was like, oh, that looks perfect. So I just copied it. <laughs> hey, you know what? That, that's the best form of flattery, right? Absolutely, absolutely. No sense of reinventing the wheel. No, I mean, and that was the thing is I was like, well, it, and it kind of goes hand in hand because the dust cover is protecting physical music media, you know, and this is essentially the same thing. So a dust cover is a dust cover, you know? Oh, that's very true. Now, uh, are they, how, how are they stacking? Like, say somebody said, oh, I only have a counter space for, that will fit one, but I like the idea I want to get two or three. Like, do they stack well or? They they can stack. They can hold the weight. Um, the only thing is they aren't designed for that just because of the way uh, there are rubber feet on the bottom and they're not put far in enough. They're kind of placed more on the outer edges of the bottom. Uh, whereas if you notice, the top dust cover kind of comes to a to a point a little bit. Uh, you know, it has a little bit of an incline on the sides. And so we don't recommend it just so that way nothing gets scratched. Um, However, after getting some feedback post launch, uh, you know, there's a ton of people who want one that holds more. Uh, and so we have actually kind of actually started putting together some plans for a like dedicated more of a drawer system that's a double decker rather than, you know, because it you, I don't want to mess up, uh, you know, the lid on the bottom since it since it's hinged in the back. You know, if you stack something on top, you can't you can't hinge it up, you know, and so. Uh, we do have some plans for that. See, that's kind of what I was thinking, like like a tool, tool box or, or even a filing yeah. cabinet style, style thing where you can yeah. literally just put all your things in drawers and they're all neatly spaced out. And, and yeah. that to me, that sounds amazing uh, right, right. with a lot. Like, oh, man, that'd be great. Because I know like uh, I do it. A lot of people do it with like Atari cartridges because there's so sure. many of them. It's just like, all right, I'll put them in a drawer like. You know, I'm not going to access them as often, but like something like that. Do you have plans to, to do something like that after this yeah. Kickstarter? Or? Yeah, we do. And, and, you know, that was kind of one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we were at a, uh, 
what do you call it? We were at an expo a couple of weekends ago, kind of demoing off our stuff and everybody's reaction to it. I mean, they were literally like stopping in their tracks, you know, to take a look at this thing. And uh, the only, the only thing that wasn't overwhelmingly positive was somebody going or three people were like, Hey, you know, can you make a bigger one? And, <laughs> and, and I realized, you know, when looking at it, it was designed to fit inside the Ikea Expedit um, you know, storing uh, shelving units that everybody has. And there's plenty of space when one is in there to have a second story full of games in it. So, uh, so once we were getting that feedback and kind of looking at the dimensions, I was like, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll bring this one to market. And then once this one's out, um, you know, we'll probably get, get moving on the plans for the uh, double decker one. And, uh, you know, the great thing is being that it is modular, should somebody get one of the current ones we have and want to upgrade, they can, you know, use the same exact insert trays on a larger one as well. Yeah, because I, I love the design. I love the idea. For me personally, like, it, if I had one of these, I would keep it out and I would just put, like, my favorites in it. Oh, yeah. Only because, well, it holds a lot. Right. That's that's relative to the collector. Um, <laughs> so if someone has, you know, like, 8 N64, 10 N64 games, it's great. But for somebody yeah. who has a full set of 260 or 290 or whatever, you know, like, this, they look at it and go, well, I'd like to put my N64 games in there, but this will hold, you know, an eighth or even a tenth of my collection. Um, yeah. You know, so I don't know who you're who your target is are you targeting the more casual i only have a few games for my yesteryear or are you also going to put out for the hardcore you know these are extra solutions because i i know in your kickstarter you actually mentioned the universal cases uh where where if you get these uh you have to print out labels and uh they do work i, I do have some stuff in it uh they are nice but they take up so much room and that's right. one of the problems. Like, I would love all my games to have all cases all across the wall. The problem is there's just not enough real estate. So, <laughs> so a smaller drawer uh, system actually, to, to me personally, is very appealing. And I'm right. sure other collectors would love that too. Even, even like maybe a stackable unit where you can get like two, four, six, whatever you need mm -hmm. uh, and stack them in a corner. Uh, are these, like, who, who is your target for this and, and who are you trying sure. to target after? Sure. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of twofold. Um, you know, I would consider myself a more casual collector. And so I kind of, that was the initial target were, uh, you know, those folks who, uh, you know, maybe in their mid to late twenties or thirties who are, you know, have a handful of games that they just really enjoy growing up, um, that they want to, you know, just keep stored. And then the alternative kind of our, our other target market that we have are those collectors that have a handful of really, really, really valuable ones. Um, cause in, you know, in that collection of 200 plus Super Nintendo in Super Nintendo games, you have, you know, maybe 20 or so that have like real concrete value, you know, that are 40, $50 or more. Um, uh, and so that's kind of, that's kind of who we're, we're targeting there where, you know, if you want to just put your most expensive cartridges, you know, store them and display them at the same time, you know, this is kind of the solution for you. Yeah, that, that's what definitely what, what I would use it for in its current state, for sure. Um, and I see that. Well, what about in the future? Like, are you going to go for more for the hardcore? Because what I've noticed lately is those casuals that you talk about, the casual collectors, uh, and, and I know many of them, uh, what happens is they keep their games that they are very fond of, but then they start realizing, well, now that I have more money, there yeah. were a bunch of games I wanted to play during that time that I couldn't afford because I can only get one game at Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever you celebrate, uh, my birthday, and suddenly, like, well, now I can go get that. And then they yeah. start saying, wow, there's like 10, 15 games I wanted to get. Now I have them. Where are they going to yeah. go now? Yeah, that's that's me. Yeah, that's me in a nutshell, man. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that was pretty so, much my childhood right there. So Yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, now that I have this thing called a job, I can actually afford all the stuff I couldn't buy as a 14-year-old. Um, so that's that's kind of the plan. Uh, the way that I the way that I work and the way that we kind of work here is whatever you know. We we have a couple of concrete base ideas, like you know the the kickstarters that we've that we've started. Um, aside from that, it's all up to the market, you know, mm -hmm. and the market really kind of dictates our decision-making process, you know. So 
when we get six emails in saying, hey, when are you going to do this or have you thought about this? Um, those definitely don't go unnoticed. You know, the first time that somebody sends me in an idea for something, I kind of make a note of it in a wonderful Google Doc. Uh, and then I kind of put a ticker every single time somebody else, you know, asks us for something similar or something identical. And then we go from there. But, um, you know, especially after our experience at the trade show, um, you know, having a solution for, you know, not just 25 or 30 games, but, you know, entire collections is definitely something that I know a lot of people uh, find appealing. Yeah, and there's another another aspect here um, uh, is cost. Um, yeah, that's, that's something, you know, like, like, I did notice this when I when I went through and I, I do want to bring it up, you know, when I went through your Kickstarter, I was like, okay, you know, how much is one of these things, you know, that'd be nice to display. Uh, and, and they were more expensive than I thought, I'll be honest with you know, they were more expensive. Um, yeah. And I was curious, what what drives that cost up that much? And, and is sure. there? Is there a way to maybe bring that down? Because I, I know lowering the cost naturally will bring in more people, you know, more of an audience, uh, higher Absolutely. cost limits, of course. Absolutely. So that was one thing that we kind of struggled with a lot, it, uh, you know, especially with our last Kickstarter, because a lot of people were like, oh my gosh, this is $29 for a tray. Uh, and I think one of the things that you know, we kind of, we kind of use as a ballpark is obviously we look at the cost of the goods to manufacture them. Um, we wish that the market was large enough to handle minimum order quantities of multiple thousands of units, but unfortunately <laughs> the market's really not there for that, um, which means that our, our order quantities um, are relatively small compared to, you know, other jobs that our manufacturers, other manufacturers get. And then, you know, so we kind of look at, okay, what's the cost to manufacture it? For these specifically, um, they're so big that the cost of shipping these ocean freight, they take up a lot of space. So, I mean, even 200 of these, uh, you know, takes up quite a bit of real estate on a boat. Uh, and, you know, that so that drives cost, the ocean freight for something of this size. And then the third thing is, you know, when we were wondering, like, when we were kind of tossing around what our different price points would be, we were like, are we the only ones that are selling acrylic that have to sell acrylic this expensive? And then when we started just looking at just acrylic display cases, we were like, oh, wow, people charge 50 or $60 for an acrylic display case for a basketball. Okay, well, that all that is is a dust cover. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> that's not actually giving you any sort of functionality. That's That's really just kind of like a little piece of acrylic that covers a basketball um, you know it doesn't have removable trays it doesn't have a hinge top on it or anything like that so um, you know when we started factoring in the different things that ours does relative to a traditional you know acrylic cover or display um, we kind of figured that it was basically right in line with with what other people charge for that type of thing yeah that, i mean that makes sense uh, the only difference i see is is a uh, someone who is getting an acrylic stand for a basketball or a case for basketball usually has one two maybe three may up to five maybe if they're super hardcore collector love basketball love you know autographs um so th then it's not as bad um right. you know depending on how many games someone has and, and how much real estate they have obviously that does that does uh, change things up uh, right. you know like that's what i was talking about with the drawer system i think that that would love to see someone come up with that. And uh, have you ever gone to like um, any like the retro forums or the game collecting forums, even Facebook groups and say, hey, would you like gauge interest? Would you guys be interested yeah. in something like this? Because there's a ton of people with huge collections, far larger yeah. than even mine, um, that they'll be like, oh, I, this is my problem. This is what I need to do because everyone seems to have problems with Super Nintendo. <laughs> Man, we, we have. And it was funny that you bring that up because uh, initially with our with the last Kickstarter we had, um, we obviously, we're really hardcore into data, and so we track everything through Google Analytics to see how people are getting to our site, where they are, what time they're looking, how long they're looking for. And so, in, you know, naturally, that brought us back to people posting our Kickstarters in specific retro game or Nintendo forums and, and reading through uh, some of the contents, mostly as a quiet spectator, uh, you know, the, the big takeaway there was, was kind of, like you said, just the price sensitivity of uh, game collectors. Unfortunately, it's not a cheap hobby. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, and it's, hey, man, I tell you what, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, I, I started this whole thing because I wanted something that, that uh, 
was quality um, that looked nice out, you know, not necessarily up in a shelf, but looked nice out, you know, on the console next to the television. Um, and I kind of, uh, you know, went from there and kind of built out. And, and if I could, if I could sell these for twenty dollars, I would sell them for twenty dollars. You know what I mean? Uh, you wouldn't be able to supply them fast enough. If you oh sold yeah, them I know. <laughs> I'd be losing. I'd be losing a lot of money on each one if I sold them for twenty dollars. So. Yeah. See, that's that. That's something that you know. I'd love to see because uh, I love, like I said, I love this design, uh, yeah. and I, I'm interested in, in getting one just for like displaying my bigger games. I'm yeah. definitely interested in looking into the Super Nintendo trays now because uh, yeah. that, that 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 thought came as you we were talking. I'm like, you know what? Like I'm thinking of my own collection. <laughs> Would that work for my shelving units? Right. You know, like I'm, I'm really like, oh my god, that might be the solution. Because I'll tell you what I did, and this is the truth. My system right now has cardboard layers, literally just thin cardboard and poster board in between uh, every two, just to put them in. Fun. So if I pull a game out, I can put it back in without having to lift the whole stack up. You're um, making me cry. Baby. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hey, it's probably a whole lot better than my system currently. Everything's just in a drawer. All my N64 and NES and Super NES games. Well, mine look fly. All right, guys. Oh, so they do. <laughs> yeah, of course. They, they're in the, the Bit Lounger large, or probably the extra large for you storage yeah. system. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, of course they look fly. Rub it in, why don't you? You know? <laughs> Yeah, and that, I tell you what, that's been the most rewarding thing out of the entire process is I was like, you know, man, at the very end of the day, at least mine look awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you know, there's there's a lot of different solutions to to all the different, you know, assets of this this hobby, and uh, you know, some people, like I said, use use a drawer. Some people, like me, use cardboard. Some people uh, use universal media cases. Other people just stack it and say to hell with it. Um, it's all different, and that's to me the most fascinating part. But your yeah. solution is by far the most unique, right. and the the most pleasant to look at. It is <laughs> it really is like it it draws attention, and that's a very good thing. Um, uh, you know, especially when you you know picture walk into a room with a bunch of games all over the place, uh, and then to have that on the table that that is actually. Uh, attention drawer and that says something when you've got a room full of games at least for a game collector <laughs> absolutely man so, so props props to you for designing it that way uh, Mike do you have any questions or anything you want to add uh, oh gosh where to start <laughs> at the um, beginning oh fun <laughs> but um, actually I'm really curious because you, like, I see a lot of solutions for games and all that and like console storage but uh what about things like uh controllers like i like for me i have all my controllers stuck in a drawer again right so have you ever thought of like something like the lines of storage or controller storage like something protected yes and you were not the first person to ask us about that so uh remember that google doc that i was telling you about where i make a nice little mark every time somebody asks me a question <laughs> <about something? laughs> That uh, that's a good one, and the, I think the thing that's the trickiest with controllers, and you know, to be honest with you, we haven't quite spent a lot of time diving into that just because all of our energy recently has been on the one that we that we just launched. But um, I think the thing that's trickiest with that is cartridges. While they are all different sizes and shapes, mm -hmm. they're roughly the same size and shape. And um, you know they, they you stand them upright, and so all you have to do is kind of contour some form of a rectangle, <laughs> uh, you know. And whereas controllers are all over the place, you know, even even just looking at just Nintendo alone, you know, and you go from the NES, and then you look, you skip over the SNES, and you look at the N sixty four, you know, and just how drastically different those two are. Um, and then I mean, good lord, the Wii U gamepad. I know that that's not retro. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's, I tell you what though, um, after kind of looking through and being able to create a modular system for basically any different type of game, you know, ultimately in the future, uh, I'm confident that we could come up with a pretty solid solution for, for controllers as well. Oh yeah. yeah one of those would be nice for retro, retro controllers yeah. for sure. Yeah. 
And it'd be really nice, like, especially considering, say, the like official N64 controllers. Like they're becoming more and more rare these days because yeah. the uh, joysticks tend to uh, die out on them. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So many controllers I've killed just playing <laughs> games like Mario Party and Banjo. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> Canary Mary. Mm. <laughs> you think that had you rotate, you know, like like Mario yeah, Party yeah. 1 with, you know, the bruises. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like a battle <laughs> scar. <laughs> oh, my, mine were all from Pokemon Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> all the mini games. Oh, I remember those. <laughs> And you, you can't go back and play those anymore. Or, or are you just going to lose? Like, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, anything else you want to add, uh, Mike? Any other questions? That was a good one. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh. I'm probably could probably ask about the... Um, <clears throat> the like we mentioned, the uh, original... Like, the... Car- or the uh, stuff for cartridge storage... What about the uh, Bitbook? Mm-hmm. So, uh, how did that one actually start out? That's a that's a man. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked me about that. Um, so there's a there's a guy that uh, that I know who he he knows that I do this this Bill Lounger business, and he follows us on Instagram. And he sent me a message, and he was like, "Hey, look at this." And so somebody had posted a uh, a picture of a small wallet looking thing that held a Game Boy Pocket and two games and people were going absolutely nuts over this thing on Instagram and I was at first I brushed it off and then I came a few weeks later I see another person post another basically the same exact product and people were going nuts about it and so I I looked into it and apparently you know about 20 years ago Nintendo in Europe had released this thing called the uh, was it the Game Boy Pocket Wallet? And basically, mm. you know, what it was, it held a Game Boy Pocket and two games, and it was leather and, you know, had a had a button on it. And uh, so I, I kind of thought, hey, that's interesting, and did some research, and they, you know, the one of the people who had posted it uh, on Instagram was obviously answering all sorts of questions about how to get one, and what he was saying was, hey, like, they didn't release this in the United States, so if you want to get one, uh, you probably have to get one off of eBay Europe mm-hmm. if they have them. You know, I mean, just, you know, uh, said, hey, you know, somebody should make one of these <laughs> and sell it here in the States. And I was like, well, um, I can be that guy. And so, then, why not? you know, uh, I basically just, you know, got in touch with a supplier that does work for me somewhere else that does bags and, and leather books or bookcases and things like that. And uh, we got it, ordered a couple of samples and I was like, hey, this is actually, this is spot on. So that's how that came to be. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. Isn't it, isn't it great when Europe gets all those cool things in Japan, <laughs> especially, and we don't get them over here, and it's like, yeah. I would totally buy that. Bring it over here. Yeah. Oh, and it's so funny on you know random forums when the West gets something that Europe doesn't, and people start complaining, and I just want to be like, are you kidding me? You guys get cool stuff all the time. <laughs> like, you know? Especially from Nintendo. Nintendo of oh. Europe is killing it. Nintendo of America, I don't know what you're doing right now. You hate yeah, us. <laughs> Get on it. <laughs> I mean, they're doing it again. Have you seen the Metroid Samus Returns limited edition that Europe is getting that we're not? It yeah. makes me cry. That's, yeah. Why wouldn't we want that steelbook? Why would America not want that steelbook? I mean, come on. America needs it. I'm, I'm tempted America. to buy that game 80 bucks or whatever, or more 100 bucks or whatever, just to bring it over here for the steelbook because the game will work. Man, I'm telling you, if you're going to spend $80 on that, you need to get yourself a bit lounger, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> like, so look for the opportunity, sell. <laughs> oh, I said I was tempted. I didn't say I was doing it yet. <laughs> I feel you. I am. I am. I say I am tempted with the with the Super Nintendo uh, ones. I mean, I may need to, you know, I may need to to see how they work uh, with our current system, because that that's better than the cardboard and uh, the paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little, just a little. Uh, yeah, well, you you got to make shifts sometimes, you know. 
it's in transition period, so I'm waiting until everything's done. But but I'm definitely looking into that now. If, if you saw these foam inserts that were kind of like our initial prototypes, it's probably no better than your cardboard, man. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, but how how now? This is a question. Uh, I didn't even think about it until just now. How easy do the games come in and out? Because there are some things that are made for like a N N Nintendo game, and you like get the jaws of life to get it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with uh, Hyperkin and yes. the, the Retron Five. <laughs> yeah, like that's that, That's exactly what my, my basis of that was. Because that's like the yeah. jaws of life to get some of those games out of there. Man, yeah, and uh, it's it's not difficult at all. Um, it, you know, we actually so what we what we did is they're they're slightly, I mean, microscopically larger than the than the cartridges themselves. So they are not going to scrape when you put them in. Um, but the acrylic is thick enough to where there's enough surface area, kind of touching the front and the back of the cartridge, to prevent it from wobbling one way or the other. Uh, and then on top of it. You know, we don't really advertise this component a lot, um, but we did have custom neoprene uh, liners that were that are manufactured to fit on the insides of the uh, the slots that hold the insert trays. So every time your cartridge hits the bottom, it's actually landing on just like a really soft piece of neoprene rubber. So that way, it makes sure that the bottom of the cartridges don't get dinged up or scratched up. Um, because when we got, I want to say maybe it was like the fourth prototype and I was going and I was like, oh, this is, this is perfect. And I'm inserting the cartridges and the slots. And I was like, man, the only thing I don't like is this clink sound whenever the plastic cartridge hits the, hits the acrylic bottom. Uh, and I was like, what can I do? And I looked into it and I was like, okay, well, it's not going to be that much more expensive to have these made. And um, long story short, uh, they are a, a nice fit. But they don't they don't give you uh, any sort of difficulty getting them in and out. Now, if you just get the trays, do you get that rubber thing too? Because like I guess I'm I'm thinking standing vertically, uh, for yeah. me, because that's how it would work for me. Uh, and I'm I'm picturing like trying to get this out like the hyperkin, and like my whole wall just coming down, trying to get like earthbound, like <laughs> oh, and the whole thing just coming down. Like, no, <laughs> no, the uh, the inserts will will only be in the um, the L and XL systems. Okay. That's yeah, good to know for someone listening. And I want to want to do that same idea, but I like mm -hmm. that because you've created something that's universally used. It could be used yeah. multitude of ways. Uh, obviously, best in in the extra large storage system. Um, but you know, I I love that. Like it's just just the idea. Like it's so simple, and yeah. no one came up with it before you. So well, props to that. Thank you. And that was the thing that, that always cracks me up the most. Uh, you know, like I said, especially being at, at a trade show a couple weekends ago and people walking by and being like, oh, it's so cool. And then immediately afterwards, the next thought is, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> it's true. It's, yeah. it's something so simple that goes over people's heads. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not rocket science, but it did take a little bit of work to kind of get, you know, perfected and to, uh, to a product worthy of the price required. So, well, it definitely looks high quality. Mike, you have anything to add on on the bit lounger? Uh, uh, not particularly. It, it's it definitely an uh, interesting system for me, or uh, at least from my point of view. Like, there's a few games I like to play here and there. Like my game, or mainly my uh, like my Zelda games, my Donkey Kong games. So I love to. Keep, I would like to keep those eventually. It's out in the open, I can display them. Although my uh, Donkey Kong Country one is a little bit uh, overplayed. <laughs> wow, that just shows love. It's character. Yeah, it's yeah. the best parts of any collection. Yeah, yeah. the labels put mostly missing, but it's all good. <laughs> That's all right. But, it's it's love. You know, yeah. if you're collecting just for monetary value, you're doing it wrong. You do it for the That's love of the game, and that yeah. game right there shows love. Hello. Well, come on. you know, sorry, but yeah. So the only other thing I do want to ask is, uh, what about things like, um, say, modern like disc-based games? So I know there's lots of systems out there, like CD racks and everything else. Is there something out there, or is there something you guys have gotten or an idea, like for storing, like, uh, say, PS2 games or GameCube games, like at least uh, 
Yes. So we, we have been tossing around the idea because I would say that after kind of getting, um, after launching the Excel system uh, and kind of showing that it had a lot of support for, you know, all sorts of retro games, um, that question has been the most asked, you know, in terms of what, what do you guys have for, for disk-based solutions? Um, and we don't have anything currently planned. However, that, that definitely is one that uh, we've been asked a lot about. And, you know, being that every decision we, we make essentially is market driven, it would be <laughs> extraordinarily foolish of us to ignore that. <laughs> Yeah. See, that surprises me. I'm not gonna lie. That that surprises me because disc-based games of, of you know GameCube and Up era, uh, they're all in DVD cases or Blu-ray yeah. cases, and you know a standard bookshelf. I mean, standard you know technically works. Uh, right. They're already in their own protective format. So I, I'm shocked actually to hear. You know, I, I expect more people would like Jaguar or you right. know like, like lesser-known cartridge systems. I think if, if I were to make an educated guess, I think that it, it may have something to do with, you know, over, over time, the amount of discs in the original cases with the original artwork kind of dwindles. Yes. And I think once people are left with essentially just the original disc and none of the other original surrounding components, I think that, um, you know, if you, if you have the original everything, then, hey, that's great. You want to hold on to that. You can you put that up on a shelf. But I think when especially when GameStop and, uh, you know, got really big and, you know, they've got all, all of these cases that have their generic, you know what I'm talking about with the oh stickers on the front. And people don't want that, you know, um, but they want somewhere nice to hold their discs. So I, I can understand uh, definitely, especially if they're coming from that. Oh, yeah, disc only. Yeah, disc 100%. I was thinking like complete. Um, but yeah, disc only for sure. Yeah, don't even get me started on GameStop. That's a whole other topic. Uh, so many times I, I go in there and they're like, hey, Barry, got a present for you. And it's just a stack of empty cases. They're like, yeah, we're going to toss these out. Do you want them? Because we're just going to use the generic stuff. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll take them. But my God, why? <laughs> At least they know you by name, though. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I made it a point, and all, all the games that managers around me are really, really awesome, and I'm friends with every one of them. And uh, I think that's the least of the better way to go to save some of this stuff because I've yeah. seen them just you know there's so many videos online of dumpster diving in GameStop specifically, oh, okay. and uh, like ugh, you can't can't do that in, in Jersey. It's actually illegal to dumpster dive. Uh, so <laughs> thankfully, they they saved me some stuff, but yeah, uh, it's terrible. What was that? They said, come on down to Texas. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of dumpster diving down there? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. That's probably terrible. <laughs> probably needles sticking out there. Like, yes, I got this case and some kind of STD. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just terrible. Uh, well, well, moving <laughs> using that as a fun segue in, <laughs> in, <laughs> into, into GameStop dumpster diving, um, you know, uh, Let's just take a look back at, you know, this is definitely a retro geared thing, but let's talk about the current present time. Um, right now, uh, Nintendo just released their sales information. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it or not. Uh, for the Switch, it's, you know, over 5 million units pretty much sold at this point. Uh, it's only been a few months. It's on fire. Um, the holidays are coming up. Um, what's your take? Like, how much do you pay attention to current stuff? Do you do you own a Switch and do you play it? And uh, you know, like, yes. what are your feelings? So, so yes, yes, and yes. I was actually a, a big time investor a couple years ago in Nintendo stock specifically. Oh wow, um, nice. So, yeah, once I had uh, I was kind of looking at it and I was like, I'm pretty sure that this is bottomed out. And if there's one thing that I know about Nintendo, um, it's that they always find a way to reinvent themselves. Um, and uh, so I, I actually held on to the stock, you know, through the Switch launch and all that fun stuff. Um, but I've got a Switch. I did my investor duty and made sure that I purchased one. Uh, and uh, I enjoy it a lot. I think it, being somebody that, you know, owns a company that I guess not everybody fully understands, um, I can empathize with Nintendo because, you know, a lot, you know, it, they've had a lot of great reaction to their product, but then you also have a lot of people that just kind of don't fundamentally understand what they're doing. But I, I think that they're, they're in their own lane, and they've always been most successful when they're on their own lane. 
I, I agree. I mean, I, I remember when the Switch was first announced, a lot of people were like, like that three minute little video, like, what? I'm not sure. Video. Like, it's pretty cool, but, you know, like, they just didn't get it. Like, oh, it's not as powerful as a PS4 or Xbox One. And the PS4 Pro just came out, and the Xbox One X is on the way, and it's not going to compete. And they don't need to. That's the amazing right. thing. Absolutely. You know, and then that was one of the things that anytime I hear somebody goes, <laughs> they say something along the lines of, oh, the tech in it is one and a half generations ago. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's about more than the horsepower under the hood. It's about the thrill of the thrill of the game and enjoying the game, you know, rather mm -hmm. than the graphics being in 5D, you know. Well, statistically, if you actually look at systems, the the system with the lowest tech usually wins. I say usually because the Wii U did not. It was a colossal <laughs> failure. But but yeah. prior to the Wii U, the Wii was the lowest tech of the 360 and PS3 and sold the most. Prior to that, the PS2 was the least powerful of the GameCube and the Xbox, and that one sold the most. Prior to that, the PlayStation 1 was weaker than both the Saturn and the N64, and, and that sold the most, you know? Well, yeah. I was just going to say, and, and I guess, um, you know, probably what the takeaway theme from there is, is the older the tech, the easier it is for, for developers to get their games on the system in terms of um, developing, you know, unique content that it might not necessarily be cutting edge, but if it's, you know, Barry sitting at home wanting to crank out a really solid game, you know, you can put one on older tech a lot easier than you can on newer tech. Absolutely. Now, what's your take on, on this third party situation? Um, I'm kind of curious um, because third parties have been skeptical. Obviously, uh, third party games don't often sell well on Nintendo systems uh, since the GameCube days, uh, especially the Wii and the Wii U for sure. Um, Capcom stated that Ultra Street Fighter 2 was a test. That passed with flying colors. Now they're saying Monster Hunter Double Cross is a test. Um, Mega Man Legacy Collection 2 just came out today. Skipped the Switch completely, as well as the 3DS. You know, NBA 2K uh, is coming out, but it's I don't think it's missing a feature. FIFA is, uh, I think, missing a feature. Um, WWE 2K will be complete. The uh, WWE, I mean, 2, 2K will be complete, but the physical copy is not coming at launch for the Switch only. Um, so, so it seems that as much as they are getting some third party right now, Right. They're not getting them 100% on board. What's your take yeah. on that? So I think what it's going to boil down to, I think that this holiday season is going to be a real big test for Nintendo and, and the third party. Um, because when you're talking about 5 million units in an install base already, in what, I mean, what has it been, five months? I mean, not even half not a even. year. Yeah. Um, and so you've got an install base of 5 million units. So what you're basically going to be looking at, you know, if, if you're knowingly having these games uh, ported with uh, missing features, you know, you're going to be looking at, okay, well, so who has a Switch and enjoys a Switch enough to own a copy of a game? If, if they own, let's say, a PS4 or an Xbox as, as another system, you know, who's going to have the uh, quote-unquote stripped-down version of FIFA? Um, or who owns a Switch that doesn't own an Xbox or a PlayStation 4 that wants to play FIFA. Um, and so I think when you're going through the holiday season, if Nintendo is able to move enough software units of the third-party games during the holiday season, I think that's going to be a big wake-up call for a lot of these third-party developers to you know, kind of get on the, get on the bandwagon. Um, where I think that Nintendo... E has a lot of opportunity is in their, um, you know, in their indie section. You know, um, I think that that can, not going to necessarily say replace third party because third party, you know, plays an important role in the market. But if they're able to get a lot of really solid independent games in their eShop, I think that it's, that, that would be a huge selling point. Well, the indie scene definitely is strong, um, but it was also strong on the Wii U. I mean, it's, there's still indie games coming out for the Wii U. So we know Nintendo-only games with droughts as well as uh, indie games are not enough to sell a system, even with such stellar titles as you know Smash and, and Mario 3D World and you know obviously Breath of the Wild at the end. Um, but you, you, I think you're right with this holiday. And I, I, I've said this on our podcast uh, for our fellow listeners, uh, that do watch our podcast, um, I feel that Nintendo launched the Switch to a soft launch, which yeah. was just in for the hardcore, just for the dedicated in March. And this holiday, now knowing it's October 27th, uh, will be the actual launch with Mario mm -hmm. Odyssey. 
and uh, this will be the real launch. So people who are like, hey, I want to get a Switch for Christmas or for Hanukkah, they'll be like, oh, well, not only can I get a new Mario, but I can, you know, Zelda and uh, ARMS and Splatoon 2 and Mario Kart, those are already out. So they have a whole library ready to go out with. And I'm I'm hoping that they do some really killer. I mean, I don't I obviously already have everything I need, but I'm hoping that they put together some incredible holiday bundles. Especially, you know, a lot of people skip the Wii U, unfortunately. Um, and so, if they want to play Zelda and then they want to play Mario, you know, there's nothing. I couldn't imagine a better bundle than a Switch with Breath of the Wild and Odyssey on it. Oh my God, <laughs> that would be amazing. Absolutely, man. So I think that, and then you know, shoot, throw in Mario Kart Eight if you if they skip the Wii, they need Mario Kart Eight too. They they won't throw in Mario Kart Eight, but I think the game they should throw in as an extra would be One Two Switch. Sure. Yeah. Which arguably should have been included anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, it should have been a pack in to begin with. Um, 100% agree. But if they're going to throw in, like, even like a Mario Odyssey bundle, even if they say, oh, I just want a Mario Odyssey, that alone is going to sell. They'll buy Zelda regardless. It should be Mario Odyssey plus one, two switch. There you go. If they do Zelda, it should be Zelda plus one, two switch. Like, they need to throw that in there as an extra bonus. Sure. Now, uh, what I was going to say with the, um, when you're talking about with the third party, um, some of them, you know, depending on if they have, you know, multiple systems, which one would they go for? I've seen a lot of people who do have every system state that they want the Switch version simply because it's portable. Like when Lego City Undercover came out, they didn't get a Wii U, so they missed it there. And they're like, well, I'm going to get the Switch version because now I can take it on the go as well. Uh, do you yeah. think, think if they lean on that, that's going to help sell to third party? I think it really can. Um, I mean, when you think about just the, the portability factor in general and how, I mean, you know, we're, we obviously, you know, we have time to sit down and play games, um, but not everybody does. And, you know, like I know that this, this is kind of cliche, but being on a subway for 20 minutes to and from work or school or something like that, or taking the bus or, you know, whatever have you, you know, there's downtime in a day. Um, that don't necess that that isn't necessarily when you're at home, and I think that you know if you enjoy video games and you have the opportunity to play really solid games out and about in some downtime, I think that that could be a huge selling point for a lot of people. Well, in Japan, it's it's a whole culture over there with handheld, but that's also kind of what gave rise to to cell phone games and mobile games. It's hey, I'm on a cell you know on a subway for 20 minutes. Let me play Candy Crush, you know, yeah. and that's why it got so big. Sure. So if you were, you know, you're obviously your president of your own company. Um, if you were given uh, president of Nintendo for, you know, let's say five, six months, let's say half a year, you, you, you're, you're giving it just as it is now. What would you do as president? To, to keep the momentum going and to make sure this holiday is a fantastic one and, and things are moving well in the future? That's a great question. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be really biased here. And this is going to be the worst answer on the planet because this is all what I want and not what would actually help the company. But okay. I want a new Animal Crossing. <laughs> hey, <laughs> there's a lot of people that want new Animal Crossing. <laughs> um, and I think what I would do, one thing that I really enjoy about Nintendo as a company is the excitement that you get whenever you know a game in a series that you enjoy playing is coming. And I think a prime example of that was, I believe it was at E3, and they had what, like a 10 second just, you know, screenshot of the Metroid Prime 4 logo and people went nuts. Oh yeah. And I, I like that pun, by the way. A you know, prime example. You're you're welcome. Um, and it's one of the things that I love about Nintendo, but it's also one of the most frustrating things. Is I just want to know. I would I I wish that they would let people know what other games that they are kind of planning on bringing to market because I do think that maybe if they were a little bit looser with some information, it would get people more excited about what's coming as opposed to focusing on just what's here and on the immediate horizon. I'm going to play devil's advocate right now. Sure. Um, while I do agree with you, um, they did that this E3. They did that with Metroid Prime 4, and they did that with Pokemon on Switch. Oh, um, they, wow. they let people know that those two games are coming and in development. However... Yeah. For every positive, oh my God, moment, there was the negative, oh, 
well, that's all you've got to show. Yeah. You know, I want to see this. This is nothing. Um, yeah. Where companies like Sony, for example, can come out on their E3, I think it was two years ago, and they're like, guess what? Final Fantasy VII, boom. Oh, um, Last Guardian, coming, boom. Shenmue three coming, boom. We win E3. And of those three, Last Guardian just came out recently after over a year since oh, yeah. that presentation. Final Fantasy seven, Kingdom Hearts three is another one, as well as Shenmue three. We don't even have release dates. So so they showed that here we're we're kind of you know letting you see our cards and people get all excited. But you can't play those games on your PS4 right now because they, they right. just don't exist. Right. So, so while people are very highly critical about Nintendo, they, they let Sony get a pass, they'll let Microsoft get a pass, but Nintendo, they don't, which is kind of unfair. Um, what's your take on that? Like, you know, if you I want them to show their cards, but do you want to say, oh, this is coming? Look at Zelda. They showed Zelda early, and then we got... <laughs> 2015, no. 2016, no. 2017. Yeah. That was excruciating. Yeah, it, as as a gigantic Zelda fan, that was quite painful. Um, and I mean, there are even, I can, one of those others, and I don't mean to deviate, but Ukulele on the Switch is another one that's driving Oh my me. god. So, I mean, we don't have to get into that, but I understand, and it's one of those things that you know, I guess at the end of the day, there really is no perfect answer because either, yeah, you show your cards and then there ends up, ends up being a lot of animosity and frustration from people wondering where, where there's more information um, or you don't give any information about anything and then people just think that you're not doing anything or working on anything exciting to build up excitement for their system. So, um, you know, I think they, at the end of the day, they do a pretty good job of doing their best with the balancing act. Um, I, I like to listen to... You know, when people ask uh, Reggie specific questions and he says, you know, we don't have any more to comment about that at this time. That's just oh, yeah. my favorite because you know what that means. Something's coming. It's just a matter of time until it's coming. <laughs> Did you hear his answer for Smash Brothers? I mean, it well, was so expertly crafted. Oh, no. He, he, this is not going to be a direct quote, but it was something along the lines of, look, ever since Smash Brothers was created back in the N64, there hasn't been a console that's come out that hasn't had Smash Brothers on it. So essentially, why would we start now? <laughs> exactly. And that's what we said. He didn't. He didn't yeah. say yes. It's for sure coming, but it was as good of a yes as possible. And honestly, sure. Nintendo, all they have to do is say, "You want this game? Yes, it's coming. Just be patient." Because you know they're going to yeah. do it. Even Metroid fans were like, oh, I throw other M, we're not going to get anything. What's Federation Force? What is this, an insult? And then we get two Metroids. Right. Yeah, and, you know, I think that that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just typical Nintendo, right? And, I mean, uh, you know, I actually, I kind of did think of something that I think, you know, you asked me earlier about what I would do with Nintendo, and, and my answer was kind of lackluster at best, but after kind of giving it a little bit more thought, I think one of the areas that they've dabbled in a little bit but haven't fully, I guess, extracted the value out of yet is the mobile game, putting their IP on, you know, cell phones, Android, you know, iOS. Um, I think that it's tricky to nail the execution on that in, you know, an ecosystem that's so cluttered with other, other IP. Um, but I think... I think if there's any company that could successfully put their their characters in a mobile platform like a cell phone, I think it would be Nintendo. I mean, they've just posted just, profit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, I just think about I, my personally, my favorite Zelda is Link's Awakening. I love the top-down Zeldas. Mine too. And, yeah, man. <laughs> And I just think to myself, you know, and of course there's the whole emulator business and all that, but I was like, you know, if Nintendo just released an eShop on the mobile phone and just had some solid, like a classic game library, they wouldn't even need to put, you know, create dedicated new content for it. They could just put their legacy library in an eShop on a mobile platform and people would go bananas. And they'd, and people would probably do that over getting an emulator anyway, you know? Well, they don't want to do that. And uh, they stated that yeah. they wanted new new experiences. They, they're more content with doing that as a selling point for their own 
consoles, the 3DS and the Switch. And you have to remember, they are also a hardware company. And unlike the other hardware companies, Sony and Microsoft, they do not take a loss on any right. piece of hardware, with the exception of the 3DS after they cut it at launch. For, for a short time, they took a loss. They, you know, every Switch sold, they making money. Every 3DS, every new 2DS Excel sold, they're making money. So if they can get people to not only purchase their items, their their digital games or, or you know, like their classic virtual console games, but on their own system. So now say, oh, I want to buy Link's Awakening again. I could pay $5 in the eShop. Well, good, Nintendo gets five bucks or, or a portion of that. Or you can go out and say, well, I want to get a 3DS. I'm going to go pay Nintendo $150 and then pay five extra bucks to download Link's Awakening. They're we're happier with that. You know what I'm hearing you say, Barry, is that Nintendo needs to make a Nintendo phone. <laughs> no, Sony did that. Do you remember the Xperia Play? Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah. Have it sitting in a bin somewhere. It's just terrible. Yeah. Hey, my brother had one of those. Yeah, they're, they're terrible. Was it? Uh, was it? I currently am using a uh, Xperia at the moment. So. <laughs> oh, look at that. At least it's not the Play. Yeah. No, it's just and, one of the and, later versions. And let's be honest. Remember the end, the end gauge? I mean, do we really oh. want side talking again? <laughs> the end gauge. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God. So, so both Sony and Nokia have already tried. Nintendo right. likes to be late to the party to watch what other people do. Uh, yeah. They've seen those two examples. I don't think you're getting a Nintendo phone. <laughs> I don't want one. Don't worry. <laughs> Oh, oh man! <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else you would like to uh, to add in here about the uh, Bit Lounger or on Nintendo's future? I'm I'm good. I think, um, like I said, you know, having been a, an investor in the past, um, it's this has been a real promising, I guess, not just six months, but I'd say maybe nine months to a year. Um, you know, I think that they've done really well to position themselves to be successful in their own way. Um, I think that while nobody's perfect, I think their execution has been fantastic. Um, and I think that they're finally starting to see the results that they that they're looking for. I will definitely agree with that. Uh, I know I know investors have got to be excited too, uh, yourself included. I'm sure you've watched that go up. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, uh, sure. no secret. That's the whole point of the stock market. Uh, right. And I know investors, especially like Monster Hunter Double Cross was announced. It, it shot up again. Um, yeah. And I'm I'm sure this holiday it's going to fly through the roof. Uh, I just hope they can keep that momentum going. Uh, but that's the stock market. It's you know up and down. So for all you listeners that are interested in the Bit Lounger, the large and the extra large storage system, the Kickstarter is live right now. It's got 15 days to go. Um, it needs a little bit of money. It's at $1,500. It needs 5000 for funding. Um, however, um, you know, uh, Evan, you said that even if it doesn't get funded, the product's still going to come out. Um, so if you are interested, show interest in this. This is a really, really great product. Um, there are a bunch of systems that are supported on this. So we didn't really talk about it. Um, but in addition to just the NES and the Super Nintendo and the N64, you got the Game Boy, you got the Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, the Super Famicom. Uh, I know you do have some stretch goals for the actual Famicom, the Master System, Genesis, and the Game Gear. Maybe Jaguar will get in there and a little Turbo Graphics love. Um, but... But uh, this is a really, really fantastic product. Uh, you guys should check this out. Uh, I will put a link to the Kickstarter in the description of the video uh, for you to check out. Uh, you should also check out the bitlounger.com um, for, for the previous products. And I'm assuming uh, this, as well as some of the other stuff we talked about, will appear there for purchase. Am I right? Absolutely. OK, well, there you go. Um, check out that site, please. Um, give this guy some love. He's crafted a phenomenal product that is quality um, and worth the price. Uh, Mike, anything you'd like to add before we go? Uh, not particularly. But, uh, not particularly. All right, well, uh, I can't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> just now no i don't i'm just here now uh <laughs> i'd like to thank uh, evan uh for joining us uh thank you so thank much you for being a part of this thank you um mike thank you for tagging along yeah. and, uh, oh absolutely anytime and uh 
for all your Nintendo news, please go to nintendofuse.com where you'll see this as well as other products like our podcast, our game chats, uh, reviews, news, everything you could want. Um, so please check us out there or on YouTube. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching.